tuned into Black Hollywood Live, the world's first digital broadcast network devoted entirely to urban entertainment and pop culture. Tune in right now. Hey guys, welcome, welcome. This is the Black Hollywood Reporter. We're so good that you're glad that you joined us today. Who it's a lot to cover this week. I mean, you've heard of blackface, but today we're talking about uh, paint down when they paint the entire actor black. Uh, the SAG after panel had an interesting discussion on it. We're going to get into it. We'll also be talking about white voiceover actors leaving a variety of roles across TV. Um, is black actors voicing black characters the way to go? Also, Trevor Noah has some ideas about cop shows and behind the scenes and how they can make um, the front of the show better. And then we're going to update you guys on Splash Mountain. You know, we talked about it last week and some changes are afoot and we're super excited. Also, Kanye West teams up with The Gap, which at first might sound crazy to you. But think about it. It makes a lot more sense the longer you think. Hmm. <laughs> Samantha Jacobs is an expert in music and she works for a big um, production company here in town. She is our resident expert on all things. I want to say Kanye. I want to jump into Kanye with you, but we're gonna we're gonna wait till the end. Welcome, <laughs> Jacobs. Hello, hi. <laughs> so we're gonna talk at the top. We're gonna get right into voice acting. That's what seems to have the most traction this week. We've seen so many articles, so many um, famous shows kind of losing their top talent, Jenny Slade's leaving Big Mouth, Kristen Bell's leaving Central Park, Mike Henry, who's worked on, who's played uh, Cleveland Brown for uh, almost 20 years, is uh, leaving Family Guy. Um, it's really interesting because these actors have kind of stirred up some controversy in the past for this thing, and all of them have kind of brushed it off and made their own excuses. Um, I think most interesting is when Jenny Slate came out and said, you know, listen, I've made excuses about this in the past, but now I see my white privilege. I've been erasing black voices and black, black people's stories, and I'm not going to be complicit in that anymore. And so I'm giving up uh, my role um, as Missy on Big Mouth. So I thought that was really interesting. Kristen Bell followed, then Mike Henry, and then The Simpsons came out and said, we're not going to have any non um, uh, white actors voice non-white characters, which is huge for them because you know that somebody made a whole complete movie. <laughs> Ari Kondabalu made a whole entire movie about Apu being voiced by a white um, man. So I think it's a really interesting um, topic to get into. Sam, what were your initial thoughts when you heard about all of these people kind of giving up their bags um, <laughs> in a sense? Yeah, I mean, I think yes right? Like, this is a smart thing to do. I'm glad that they're doing this. I'm glad it's being acknowledged. Because if you think about it, a lot of it is like a stereotype character. Mm. Like if we look at the Simpsons, for example, it's like the stereotypical accent and all that stuff. So I don't know, are they going to adjust the characters as a whole on their show? Or is it just going to be just like, okay, we're going to keep the stereotype, but we're going to fill it in with someone of color. So I think it's still a lot of thinking around it. But for people, I was really shocked. I didn't even know Kristen Bell was one of these people. So I'm glad that she definitely stepped down. And, you know, obviously, she's a bigger name. Obviously, she's in Frozen. So it's like, there's... Um, good things coming from it you know yeah so we just have to wait and see <laughs> yeah it's interesting that Christian Bell came out because her character if you want to get specific her character is biracial and so is Jenny Slates right both of their characters are biracial and um they both talk about how you know we kind of excused it away and we kind of you know um, said, well, she's biracial and I'm white, and so she's half white, and so it's kind kind of works. But Kristen Bell says it undermines the speci the speci specificity. That's it. The specificity of mixed race and the Black American experience, which I think you have to get into the nuances of that character, and you just cannot do that if you're not black. That's going to be really difficult to do. I think our next um, slide thrown up is Mike Henry. And then I was just I was just wanting to talk about how some of those black nuances are really important in developing characters. I know um, 
there was an actor that voiced um, one of my favorite characters in Hey Arnold, also um, Recess, <laughs> just, just two, like the best cartoons of the 90s, right? That kind of shaped our childhoods. And those actors were voiced, those, those characters were voiced by Black actors. And I think there's just such nuance that they brought to those characters that, like you said, when you're a white character playing a black character, it kind of tends to go stereotypical and it's kind of hard to capture that nuance. And so I think it really is important to remember who is, you know, getting that voice. And I think what was interesting about Central Park was that when they first got the um, the critique for Kristen Bell playing the mixed race um, little girl, one of the creators said Kristen needed to be Molly. We, we could not make her Molly. She was Molly. But then he said that on this panel. But then when they dug more into it and found out how they cast the character, he basically said, we, fo- we first cast Josh Gad, who, do- who voices Olaf. And then they asked him, and I quote, who are your friends? Who do you want to work with? And so, of course, who are your friends? Who do I want to work with? He- he's worked with Kristen Bell's for- Bell for years, so he suggested her, and then they hired her. Right. Mm-hmm. And then they said, oh, well, nobody else could do it. We couldn't see anybody else. But the key is you didn't look for characters of, for voice actors of color. Right. Because you already told us that that's how you chose was from Josh Gad's pool. Like, so that's so fascinating to me. And also, it really says a lot about Kristen Bell because she came out in front of the show. Like, I think the show followed her lead because it was initially her who came out and said, I don't think I should be voicing this character anymore, even though it took her a while to get to that point. But so anyway, I just think that's um, fascinating and also just kind of disappointing. It's crazy because that's how Hollywood works, right? When someone you want to work with people that you know, and it's like, who is your circle? And a lot of it is word of mouth. A lot of it is networking, right? And so it's like, if these I want to know if they mentioned the race of the character before they asked him that question. Hmm. You know what I mean? Because, sure, he's done years with her in Frozen. They probably have, like, some special bond, blah, 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 brother, sister, love. (laughs) And so, of course, he's going to be like, yeah, I'm going to get her a gig. Like, she's my girl. Right. And then it's like, okay, but did you discuss the other elements of this character? You know? Because I've been asked before, like, hey, do you know someone of this? And I always I'm like, what is this? What is the vibe? Who's the person? What is like, what do you what do you what are you looking for? And then I can tell you, okay, these people work well. Mm. So I don't know. I don't know. I think it's maybe it's a casting mind versus like you're just helping your friend out. I don't know. So that's really interesting to me, because if they asked if they came up front with like the facts. I wonder if he still would have said Kristen Bell. That's interesting too. I also think like it's fascinating because what happens with white voice actors, and I think this just happens with white actors, period. They're used to playing things that are universal. They're used Mm -hmm. to playing everything, right? Mm -hmm. Like white actors just are. They're used to playing everything all the time. And so why would voice acting be any different when they're used to doing things universally? But what I've read about the Black voice acting community is they're not seen as being universal, right? Black voice Mm -hmm. actors are seen as doing one particular thing. So then that really limits your opportunities. If as a Black voice actor, you only seem to do one thing and then white voice actors can do all the things, then they get your job plus their job plus everybody else's job. That doesn't seem very fair. Yeah. So anyway, I think it's really... um, it really says a lot when someone gives up their money, though, because because mm-hmm. post the black square is one thing, but to give up your bag is a whole nother thing. So I, I like to see action. So I, I at least I got to give props out for that. I know um, a couple of days ago, Carrie Washington posted on Twitter that she's available for uh, animation work and it got like 200,000 likes. And the voice of Tiana also tweeted that she was like, Hey, I do this really well. So if you want to at me, do it. So uh, I mean, yeah. yeah, cause she came from Broadway, I think. So she doesn't do much mm-hmm. or like she hasn't done anything as big as princess of the frog, unfortunately. So give her a call. 
Yeah, that, <laughs> that's awesome. And then I know that Wendell Pierce from um, The Wire said that he's putting out a self campaign. He put on Twitter, I'm campaigning for myself to um, replace, is it Michael, Mike Henry um, for Cleveland Brown, which I thought was really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> for Cleveland totally Brown, opposite. Brown show, but bro the Cleveland Brown show was canceled seven years ago so good luck with that I mean you could be Cleveland Brown on Family Guy but he ain't got no show no more so mm -mm. and that, that <laughs> a little controversial thing his show so we wanted to get right into we talked a little bit about blackface but this week we learned about paint down which I think blew both of our minds we were like excuse me what so Sam, tell us a little bit about the SAG AFTRA panel. Yeah, so SAG AFTRA has this educational um, panel thing that they do, and they did one on race and storytelling. And there, they had a full-on panel. It consisted of everyone and every element, from director to casting to actor. And uh, Jason George, what brought forward something that he recognized when he was on an indie film set, um, they needed this movie was about. Uh, rock climbing and so they needed someone to be his stunt double and so when he went into production they saw them painting down a guy to make him darker and he was like what is this what are you doing and they're like oh this is called a paint down because he's your stunt double he can do everything we just need to make him look like you and he was like no 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 no." and so he took that i mean a big props to him because this is an indie film and indie films usually have a little lower budget but he went straight to the to the director and was like this is not okay you need to hire somebody of color that looks like me to be my stunt double that's the point and so they did they listened to him so i'm really glad that they did do that and that was the first time he personally ever saw something like that happen and since the people responded with the name paint down i'm assuming this happened a lot i've never heard of this before but i'm that doesn't surprise me at all so that was a big story that was told on the panel what do you think about that Kay? do you think that they're going to continue doing this or do you think this still happens i mean this movie no, came out a happen. while ago no it does still happen because i go like I re I'm sorry, I didn't Google it. I researched it, guys. I researched it. <laughs> um, and I found, like, it is really prevalent on film sets when you have people um, impersonating, playing, I don't even know what it's called, uh, minstrel showing, uh, people of Native American descent. They do that a lot with Native people. Wow. I think it's wild. One guy even said, came to him and the, and the makeup said orange Indian paint. And they painted down a bunch of background actors in orange Indian paint. I was like, this is crazy. This, it was recently, like years ago. So I think that's, I, I, mm, it's why. See, that makes me, oh, that makes me so upset because this was another part of the panel too. I'll just switch up the order of doing this. Yeah. They were talking about how there's no one on set who, this, this is just talked about always, all the time everything you talk about not just this panel always and this is the issue no one is there on set no makeup artist no hair designer knows how to do black hair or makeup they don't know how to adjust the lighting they don't know how to do any of that and that is bogus i mean yes makeup in general is hard so like for you you should be able to do everything though especially now when there's so many makeup brands that are catered to that and people still don't know. And so for them to be doing paint downs, but they can't get someone to get the person the right makeup and hair, that is ridiculous. That That's disgusting. Like, why are you wasting money when you should be investing that money to like doing something on the daily, right? Doing something that should be acknowledged and used. So that makes me mad <laughs> i'm that? mad it makes me mad. you're a bad no oh uh, yeah but like you said i think the very our very um first black hollywood reporter we talked about like how rampant that is and how a bunch of black actresses were speaking out about it it's just yeah it's crazy it's just those micro and macro ways that let you know when you get on set that this is really isn't built for you you know mm -hmm. you have to make accommodations which is insane because if you want to be somewhere where black people feel welcome and they feel like it's made for them and it's built for them, you have got to be more inclusive than just saying it, right? 
And those ways that you are inclusive is that you write better for black characters. Um, you hire black people behind the scenes and below the line. You have makeup and hair that is competent and knows what they're doing, you know? So it's just like, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what else to say about it. It's wild. Yeah, and it's wild. That that goes along like yes the, there's micro thing micro aggression that can portray ma that turn into macro right like mm -hmm. paris barkley who's a famous director when he started doing when he was on e directing er which was like an emmy winning show like was on forever like this and not only that that wasn't like his only show like he did west wing he did glee he did smash like all these hits and he was at the warner brother lot and the security guard was like, are you picking up mail? Where are you going? Where and you he was like, yeah, what are you dropping off? And he's like, I'm dropping off my knowledge to direct ER, like this show. And I was like, I would respond like that too. I was so proud that he said that. And I, uh, everyone says like, it starts at the top, right? Like the president of the company is gonna portray this inclusiveness and it's gonna sprinkle down. But it's, you know, the security person judged him. And like that, that's a little thing that I don't even think if the president of the company trickled down his love for inclusiveness would have, if that's, that probably still would have happened, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, how do you change that mindset? Because obviously they let him on to the set and go about his business, but like he had to push for that. And obviously that's not the first time anybody's probably been encountered with a conversation like that at the studio. Yeah. Like you got doesn't start like a coffee shop. You just, you just got to defund security guards. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> speaking, speaking of, speaking of propaganda. It was interesting. I was watching um, The Invisible Man the other night, and I could not, it, I could not believe the subtle propaganda that ran through that entire film. I was just like, my eyes are open now. Like this guy is in an invisible suit, and he has fought twelve cops, and none of them has shot at him. Even in an invisible suit, his white privilege reigns supreme. I could not believe it. Okay, that has nothing to do with nothing. I just hate. <laughs> I loved that movie though. I need to watch it again now, now that you okay, said no, that. I saw no. this. That was the last movie I saw in the movie theater before oh, COVID. The movies and saw like, oh, I just saw that home the other night. But yeah, no, I want my money back. Okay, so Trevor Noah, <laughs> Trevor is just talking on his show. He always, I mean, his show is just doing great in quarantine. I feel like he's doing an excellent job. But he's calling on cop shows to change their portray portrayals of police on TV, similar to what we talked about last week um, with uh, color change. But he was mm -hmm. saying, showing some clips that show basically the only way cops can get the truth out of different assailants is by beating them. When Actually, the opposite is true, right? When, once you go into torturing someone, it's more likely that they're just going to tell you whatever. So you'll let them live and leave them alone. Um, but so that was really interesting because he showed that it's really hard to watch. He showed cop shows where, um, you know, just TV shows where cops are beating people up. But then at the end, he showed like real incidents of police brutality. And it's like difficult to watch. You know, when you are watching something and just like on the cop side, like, yeah, when Mariska Hardigan is doing whatever she needs to mm -hmm. do. Um, it's just, it's, it's, I, I, I don't know, heartbreaking to see it juxtaposed with an actual real police brutality. I think most of us have seen the George Floyd tape, various tapes um, of police basically abusing their power and beating um, innocent civilians, right? And so anyway, his plea was that show creators, directors, and writers in Hollywood who make the cop shows, and a lot of them have been tweeting, right, about how cops need to be doing better and they've donated money but he's like you guys need to go a step further and and you need to do something about the way that police are portrayed on screen and that starts with creators directors and writers so I thought that was really good to call that out and not just to think about what goes into the show and the people that create the show realizing we need to hold those people responsible. They need to have some level of accountability 
for how how cops are portrayed on TV. What did you think about that, Sam? I know you love Trevor Noah. I do love him <laughs> for various reasons. <laughs> <laughs> but um, like you said, yes, it was hard to watch. Um, this all goes in line with what we talked about two weeks ago, right? With Color of Change. You know, there is, we need to like el- eliminate the injustice system. There needs to be a change in how things are being portrayed. And it all starts with the writers, right? And Or whoever, I guess the director can approve whatever vision that is going to be portrayed. I mean, even with shows like Shades of Blue, like J-Lo is the head cop. She's Latina. So like even on those shows, it's like you can't just have the token lead and do little things of how she has adjusted to society you know what I mean Mm -hmm. and it's there needs to be more than just your tokens and I think that's just where we're where where we're at and Trevor Noah is just speaking to the color of change's idea of what needs to be done I hope maybe since he's big enough like he can work with them and then maybe something more can spiral you know and kind of get things ahead because he's in a writer room right so maybe maybe he's the man to make some change since he broadcasted it on his talk show yeah and and I thought about him because the daily show John Stewart who was the previous host and very successful and now doing movies and whatnot um he came out in a statement this week talking about how he regrets that his show didn't do enough to hire Um, black writers and uh, women writers. Um, He basically said, you know, we do the thing where we'd say we're going to, we're not going to discriminate. And they would take the names off of the packets they would receive. But he was like, when it came to tone and content, we were basically looking for, you know, white, like white guy teams and like Mm -hmm. people that graduated from where we graduated and grew up where we grew up and people that have our same experiences. So he was like, that's how I ended up with a, with a writer's room full of white guys. Even though I was saying that I was, um, you know, looking at everybody, he was like, I really didn't do what I needed to do, which is I needed to be more conscious about give me a stack of women, give me a stack of black um, writers and be looking outside of our experience and kind of outside of our clique at people who are bringing something different. So I thought that was really interesting. I mean, it's a little too, it's kind of too little too late. Sam, what do you think? Yeah, it is. I mean, I I don't know if he wanted to say that was an apology. <laughs> I don't know, um, but uh, okay. Talk shows, talk show has the history. It's always a man, it's never a woman. From radio to television, the night shift for some reason is never given to a female. So that, alone is there right and then you add people of color black people where are you at and I don't know if this is aligned with how comedy works right because stand-up and comedy is all have that same progression right oh you're a woman you're not funny so it's like okay so women aren't funny so now they're not gonna write for my talk show which is supposed to be funny because it's late night you know and then it's like okay now people aren't gonna get it because it's a black writer there's a mass like what company you are, mass people, million people are watching this. Is everyone going to understand this? And it's like, ooh, that's just not a good look. And that has been a stigma that has been around for ever. You know what I mean? So it's like, yes, we're slowly changing things. I mean, Chelsea Handler had her own show. Like Lily Singh has her own show now. But it's also like we don't, we, there's never really been a night show I mean Arsenio <laughs> like back in the day was that night I don't know I'm too young for that I don't yeah, know I, <laughs> but, <laughs> she had her own show on on BET for like a year she was great she was but great but, BET, but now right? on, that's was, not ABC that's not a major network that's not ABC that's not CBS you know that's BET that's a specific channel mm-hmm. it's not something that's open to the it's not a major market a mainstream market right yeah so hopefully yeah. they see this <laughs> well change. good for her because she, they, they let her show go they cancel her show but then you know not even a year later she comes back with the black lady sketch show it's mm-hmm. on HBO 
people, I mean, it has so much Emmy buzz around it. Everybody's watching. It has get great reviews. It's been renewed for season two. So mm -hmm. she's going to win either way. Like she, she doesn't yeah. care. She's going to win. Yeah. So we just quickly say that we are the Black Hollywood Reporter and here we are so grateful for you tuning in and watching us. If you are watching us on YouTube, please give us a thumbs up. We'd love to hear your comments so give us some of those. Also if you're listening to us via podcast we really enjoy five star reviews so go ahead and hit those five stars. You can make comments there as well. We want to thank Maria Menudos and Kevin Andegaro for giving us this opportunity and this platform to talk about creatives and everything behind the scenes when it comes to a, the black point of view and in black America, we love doing it. We love bringing you guys this show. And so we'll give our Twitter, our Twitter and Instagram handles after, because we also love to keep in contact with you guys as well. So moving on a lot of things, lighting up social media, uh, this past week, splash mountain being one, we talked about it last week. We have a good update from Sam. Yes, yeah, so I'm so glad we talked about this last week because it went viral literally like three or four days after we did this, did our show. Uh, Splash Mountain is approved to be changed to Princess and the Frog. So Disney heard us and they're doing it and they're, uh, there's no set date. They wanted to make this a process. They really want to make this something important i don't know like are, say disney opens in july like they want to it's like are they is it already closed down is splash mountain closed down or are they gonna let people ride the ride one last time how it is and then um you know close it for reconstruction that's what i want to know because i'm like are you gonna just like out of covid just like no more splash mountain <laughs> That's a good point. And the plus is like one of the only like water rides. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. so summer, it's hot. I don't know. We'll see. But I'm really happy that two Imagineers that are going to be a part of this are Black women. So yay. And they're so excited to represent Tiana and kind of make the magic that always happens around Disney. Um, so I'm just hoping, you know, their names are Sharita Carter and Carmen Smith. They're creative development and inclu inclusive strategy people. So I hope that their voices do get heard on this because there's going to be a lot of little details that are going to make this even more magical. So I, I'm excited. I can't wait to see it. It's going to be so pretty. I can't wait. I think we have <laughs> bit too of like the rendering, the new rendering. It is so pretty. I agree with you, Sam. It's going to be beautiful. And I feel like the Princess and the Frog has, the movie, has so many great details, so many, so much great um, animation of an African-American characters, and the voice work is beautiful, and there's so many, like, really good details. I just think that, um, I'm just so excited to see how that translate into, translates into the ride. I just think it's mm -hmm. going to be, it's, it's going to be super exciting. Yeah. It's going to be the backest ride. It is. <laughs> it is. Unless I they get like or something, it's going to be the blackest Disney ride. <laughs> but I hope, I, what I hope is that people appreciate it and realize like, oh man, we really were missing out. I can't believe we didn't have Tiana before this. Tiana is awesome. We needed more Tiana. I hope people realize that and aren't just like, why are they changing stuff? Because, you know, people don't like change or whatever. So, mm -hmm. yeah, hopefully people okay. can appreciate it. Then we found out that Mr. Kanye West, otherwise named, known as Yeezy, otherwise known as Ye, <laughs> is teaming up with the Gap. This is like the craziest thing I heard <laughs> this week. I think that I saw this on Twitter and I was like, is this for real? But like you said earlier, this is probably the smartest thing ever. So Gap has been in trouble. Gap has been tanking. They had crazy turnaround rates from creative director to the CEO. And so now there's a woman of color as the CEO and this deal got launched. I mean, if you look at his line, he's all about the basic wear, right? His easy launch is colors, and basics. So what is Gap? 
colors <laughs> and basics. I don't know what is a better decision to make. And I know it might seem a little weird because he's, you know, um, coming from Louis Vuitton and he's like this luxury guy and he did the deal with Adidas for his Yeezys. And like now he's doing something that's more affordable. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because it fits with his brand. Like it fits with what he's doing. And it's not just for adults. Like he wants to be, well, it's men, women, children, juniors. It's like going to be the whole shebang. And it's a perfect fit. And if you know Kanye, he used to work at The Gap. And the Gap that he worked at in Chicago, he posted this big letter on the building and it was like hey I'm back basically is what it said we can post it on Instagram um, if you follow us to show you what it says exactly but he wrote this whole thing I was like this is the Chicago I shopped at this is the Chicago or gap that I um you know worked at and all this stuff and I don't know it's like it's a good it's a feel good situation <laughs> I mean gap okay this is what's really crazy gap stocks the moment it was announced, went yeah. up 42% and what? Adidas tanked. So I'm like, are the Adidas people who are investing because of the Yeezys moving over to Gap? And so now Gap stocks are already up and they're hoping for a 100 or 1 billion revenue turnaround for the company. So they're really depending on Kanye to fix Gap. <laughs> Which is like, I'm not mad at it. What do you think, Kay? Do you think this is a smart decision? Would you invest in Gap? <laughs> Bruh, no, I would not invest in Gap. I would, I would, no, but Kanye's political views are too crazy for me. I was going to say, I would invest in Kanye. Look, Kanye is going to make money either way. Here's, here's the thing. Gap, like you said, in 2019, made 4.6 billion in revenue and it, they were down from the previous year stores have been closing all over the place they're not doing great but now they're saying we're planning on 1 billion in revenue once Kanye things you know once Kanye lines comes through so you're expecting Kanye to do almost a fourth of your business nah bro like <laughs> I just don't think that's a good plan I think I feel Okay, I don't feel completely bad for Kanye. Kanye is a billionaire, okay? Mm -hmm. um, but I'm like, are they trying to set Kanye up to take the fall for the gap? Because if it doesn't work for him, that the gap is probably going to tank. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so they're going to be like, mm -hmm. well, Kanye, it was on Kanye's watch. You know what I mean? We hadn't invested that bit. You know, we hadn't invested all that money in Kanye. We thought he was going to bring us a billion dollars back. So I'm like, oh, I just worry that he's getting set, set up to fail. That's all. That's all. I'm just kind of worried. I mean, I do think it's funny that he used to work at the Gap. The same thing, like you said, because he had <laughs> on his on his debut um, album. He, it says uh, there's a song called Spaceship where he talks about mm -hmm. um, when he used to work in the Gap. Uh, it, it's funny because he says they he talks about stealing from the cash register, and then he says they take me to the back and pat me and ask about some khaki. But let some black folks come in. I bet you they show off their token blackie. Oh, yeah, they love Kanye. Now let's put them all in the front of the store. <laughs> so I thought that was interesting. I was like, you really in the front of the store now, bro? I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> so I guess it made him around. He was like, listen, maybe, I, I don't know. No, I, I mean, you know, props to him. I, I think it's interesting that Adidas stock fail. I didn't realize that, Sam. When you said that, I was kind of like, what? Because he's not going to be doing shoes for the guy. Mm -hmm. He's going to stay doing um, the Adidas Yeezy. And I feel like the Yeezy, I was reading the article in Forbes when he got um, proclaimed a billionaire. And they mm -hmm. were just talking about how much of his revenue is generated by Yeezy and how much money Yeezy makes in comparison to Jordan. It is right behind Jordan. It's like second under Jordan. And Jordan is a legacy brand that's been around for 20 some odd, you know, plus years. And Ye is a brand new brand for him to be making as much money as he is off of Yeezy is just insane to me. I, I mean, if I was a, 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 a an investing woman, a betting, a gambling woman, <laughs> I would be putting all my money on Adidas and Yeezy. That's not like th those do not fail because they they figured out a perfect plan when it comes to launch and 
supply versus demand. I mean, it's just crazy with those. So I don't know. I just think you had some really good points about him doing basic wear and Gap doing basic wear, but I just never thought I would see the Louis Vuitton Don. <laughs> the Louis Vuitton Don doing Gap. So it was, a, it was a shocker to me. The Polo King, like what? I was just like, I well, he said he said in interviews in the past, like, hey, I want to, I want to work for Gap. Like they're like, what's what's the brand that you want? And he was like, Gap. And he got denied. They were like, no, man, like what? You don't fit our brand or lifestyle. And he got shut down and shut down. So this happening, he was like, I told you so. I said in my interview in 2000, what, 15? And now it's 2020. <laughs> and I'm, I'm basically making the company successful. I think that he's going to work with Kim. And they might put Skims, Kim's like shapewear line and intimate uh -huh. line and pajamas. I think they might roll that over to Gap oh. because it's, it's online only. And I think this would be a good opportunity for people to try it on, be in stores, blah, blah. I don't know if it actually <laughs> happened, but I think that would be a smart decision because people go crazy for them. People are still on the Kardashian ride. It's like, mm. it's, it's so crazy. It's crazy. That's smart though, Sam. You're a business woman. You mm -hmm. have a bag. Let's talk after this about some ideas I had. <laughs> we should. I see if I had money, I would be on top of all this. You You're just, just give me the ideas, I'll make it happen. You oh, just need man. to put me in the room and I got them. <laughs> you gotta get you some investors. That is so funny. That's a really good point. You just gonna roll everything over there. Just everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. So maybe we'll just get used to seeing Kanye and um, Kanye at the Gap. I think it's Y. Is it Y Z Y? Is Z Z Y Z Y? I've seen some mock-ups of it. I don't know if it's true or people just make it up this like um, uh, a logo for him. But yeah, I yeah. saw the, the note he wrote on the side. They blew it up on the side of the store in Chicago. That was really cool. I mean, generally, I don't wish for people to fail. I don't wish wish for Kanye to fail. I just I just think it's interesting. That's all. So. We'll follow it and see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you guys for joining us today on the Black Hollywood Reporter. We've had a great time chatting it up. Hopefully um, you guys have learned something or maybe you heard something and you was like, girl, I don't know about that. Then hit us in the comments. Who we want to hear everything. Sam, where can these guys catch up with you? You can find me on Instagram at story of underscore Samantha. And then you can also find me on Twitter at Miss under MS underscore Sammy J J A Y. Nice. And for me, you can find me at host K that's H O S T K A Y on Instagram and on Twitter. We will talk to you guys next week. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. On behalf of our BHL staff, we would like to thank you for tuning in to Black Hollywood Live, the world's first digital broadcast network devoted entirely to urban entertainment and pop culture. Check out our Black Hollywood Live YouTube page for even more great programming and amazing content. And be sure to subscribe and like our channel when you do. I'm your BHL host, Nakia Monet, and you can find me on all social media at Kiki Boom Boom or at Black Hollywood Live. Black Hollywood Live, Hollywood Redefined.